Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session on type classes in Scala 3 with Ayush. Thank you for joining this session. And we are uh, thankful for Ayush to be part of this conference and speak with us. Hey, so hi, everybody, and welcome to this talk. Uh, really happy to be here and thankful to all of you who have joined. Uh, before we begin, I really like to thank uh, the organizers of Functional Conf on behalf of all of us. Uh, they have put together a really nice conference. There are so many FP languages and talks on so many FP languages, so it's really good. So in this talk, we are going to discuss type classes. Uh, before we start, something about me. My name is Ayush. I work as a software engineer at ING Bank in Netherlands. If you wish to know more about me and what we do at ING, specifically about Scala, then please do reach out to me uh, on my mail address, on my Twitter handle, and of course, after this talk on the Hangout. So the purpose for this talk is for us to understand what are type classes and how we can write better code using type classes. You can break this talk into two parts. The first part is uh, simple and easier. It's about uh, introduction to type classes, we will encode type classes using Scala 3 syntax. So we will have a look at some uh, fairly new concepts of Scala 3. And wherever possible, I will point out the difference between Scala 2 and Scala 3 syntax. The second part of this talk is going to be about automatic type class derivation. This is where we will look at some meta programming concepts. So we will try to take some easy examples because metaprogramming can be a bit uh, challenging when people hear it for the first time. So let's get started. Uh, first things first, why do we need type classes? What benefit do they bring? Uh, let's see an example and understand their importance. Uh, suppose we have these two nice case classes in Scala. Uh, there's a case class called worker and there is a case class uh, task. They both have some attributes, an employee ID and name for worker and ID and channel for task. So sometime later, we get a requirement that we must write a feature to show these classes or stringify instances of these classes. So we need to convert an instance of worker into a string. And the requirement is that maybe we are logging that string somewhere in our application. We are also told that the default to string that the Scala gives for case classes is not enough. We need to write more domain specific data in the two string conversion. So we are looking for our own methods to convert instances of worker and task into a string. So how do we start? Well, the first approach that everybody would take is to write uh, methods that take those uh, instances and convert them into a string. So what we do here is we basically have two different methods. They are, uh, have the same name, then it's called show. Each of them takes a worker and a task uh, instance and then returns a nice string version for that particular instance. So we are using, uh, we are saying worker has a corporate key and he has a first name and we are using some property. And for task, we are saying here is a unique identifier and here is a task channel. So we wrote two nice show methods and uh, you would see that we are doing method overloading here because the name is same, the return type is same and the instances are different. So using method overloading, we are able to achieve what we want. We are able to stringify these two instances. However, there are some issues with this approach. Uh, where should these methods go? the show methods. Ideally in FP, we would want them to be inside the class worker and the task. We want to uh, couple them together. Uh, but what if these two classes are not in our source, in our, not in our source control? Maybe these classes are coming from a third party library and we don't have control over their source code. Uh, then we can't add these methods in these classes for sure. So that's one problem with this approach. The other problem is that method overloading in general is better avoided because especially with Scala, where you can do lifting of methods to functions, 
and where you have default parameters, method overloading can cause some issues. There is a nice Stack Overflow post where in detail people describe why uh, method overloading is best avoided. So we look for alternatives to this problem of uh, stringifying a worker in a task. We introduce a parent trait called as show. And this trait has a method show, which returns a string. And then we basically extend our worker class and task class using uh, the show trait. Uh, once we extend and when we implement the show methods for these two classes, uh, we can basically call worker.show or task.show and it works fine. But again, we have the same set of problem. We had to change the original worker class and the original task class to achieve this behavior of showing them. So to make worker and task showable, we had to change their source code, their original code. And that's something that is really not in our control sometimes. Sometimes we won't have access to this source code. We could want we might be applying these methods on a class which is beyond our source control. Uh, so that's a problem that we are seeing repeatedly that we are trying to add behavior to a class which is not in our control. With, so we want to add a behavior, but we don't want to change the original code. So how can we achieve this behavior? So there is a pattern in Scala called the type class pattern, which is the reason why we are in this talk, which has this exact purpose. So this feature that we are trying to achieve, this feature of building behaviors, which are completely decoupled from the original data type. So we can build behaviors on a type without changing the type itself. This feature is known as ad hoc polymorphism. So it allows us to build functionalities which are decoupled from the underlying data type on which those functionalities operate. Now we can implement polymorphic functions which operate on types we have no control over. So I could even show for a, a class which is maybe in standard Scala library like int or long. So uh, that's the goal that we are trying to achieve using type class pattern. We are trying to add functionality without changing the original type because the original type might not be in our control. So now we have this definition of type class and the use of type class clear. Let's see how this pattern works. Uh, the first place to start this pattern is a parametric trait. So in this case, because we want to show something we create a trait called showable. It takes one type parameter A and it has a method called show. The method show takes an instance of A and returns a string. So this method basically will take an instance of A and return a string and that's all it does. Now it should be pointed out at this point that showable of A by itself is not a new type. I mean, there is no type right now. Only once we specify what A is, we get a new type. So if we create a showable of integer, we get a new type. If we create a showable of uh, dog, user, employee, whatever case class, we get a new type. So when we specify A, we get a new type. And that is why this is also known as a type constructor. It creates new types and this type a is known as a type parameter. So what we are saying here is that in order to show A, in order to show A and A can be anything, we need to have a showable of A present. So let's see how we can give a showable of A. So for, we have the case class worker here again, and this is how we give a showable of worker. We see a new keyword here. This is a keyword in Scala 3, it's called as given. So we are saying that here is an anonymous given for showable of worker with this implementation of the show method. So this is basically how we provide the compiler and implementation of showable of worker. This is how we give the compiler. And this, these keywords are also quite nice. Uh, it makes it easier to understand. You are giving a showable of worker with this definition of show. 
Now, all we have done so far is we have defined a type class called showable and we have provided a showable instance for worker class. Now, the same could be achieved in Scala 2 also using the implicit case object uh, annotations and the implicit case object uh, keywords and extending the showable of worker. But as you can see, the Scala 3 syntax is probably more concise. Okay, so now we have a showable type class and we have a showable of worker. How do we use it? Uh, so using type classes. Uh, so we defined a showable type class, a showable worker. So we might have a method in our uh, code, say log, which basically is going to log instances of type A in our system for uh, for just simplifications, I'm doing a println, but in reality, it could be logging to Kafka or to Elastic or whatever. So what we are saying in this method is that in order to log A, you need a showable of A to be present. So log will use this showable instance to log an instance of type A. So the keyword here is using. So this method can only be called on a type A for which we have a showable of A instance present. So in Scala 2, you would have seen the same being achieved by passing the implicit parameter. And in Scala 3, we are using the keyword using. Now, because we already have a showable of worker, we can call the log method on a worker instance. And this will compile fine and run fine. However, if we try to call log on some other class say task for which we do not have a showable defined yet, it will not compile. It will fail at compile time because it needs to use a showable of task and there is no showable of task given yet. So it won't work. So this is a compile time safety check that we get. Now it's possible to provide a showable of task. Of course we can do that irrespective of where this task class is present. It can be in a third party library. It can be in the Scala standard library. It can be anywhere, but we can still give a showable of task with this show implementation, and then we can call the log method. And now it will work fine. So this is basically decoupling of a type and the functionality that we get on that type. Now let's look at another example and just get some more familiarity with this type class concept. We have a trait called equals, which takes one type parameter and it defines a method called equals, which takes two instances of A, A and B, and then checks them for their equality. Now we can create an instance of equals of worker with this implementation. And we are free to choose whatever implementation we want. So for us, we are saying that if the two workers have the same employee ID, then they are same. So now we are going to uh, use, you now we already saw how we use the instance of uh, equals in the previous log method. Uh, I have to pause for a minute because my Roomba just got on. So one second. Yeah, I'm back. So my Roomba automatically runs at Friday 11.30 and he was on time. Okay. So we were saying that we already saw in the previous uh, methods that e by the keyword using, we could pass a given instance of a type class to the method. But what if we want to get a handle to this instance ourselves? We want to get a handle to this given instance ourselves. How we do, do it? So the keyword for that is summon. We can basically summon a given instance for a type class. So when we say summon equals for worker, the compiler is going to look for a given implementation of equals for worker. And if it finds one, it is going to compile fine and return that. Otherwise it will fail at compile time. And the summon keyword is somewhat similar to what implicitly function would do 
in the Scala 2 world. Uh, and once we have a handle to the summon instance, we can call the equals method on it. Now, again, if we try to call the summon method on a type class, which is not available yet, like the equals of task, then we get a compile time failure. Okay. There's one more feature to type classes in Scala 3 and which is extension methods. So there is a keyword called extension and the syntax is like this. So we have the type class again, the equals type class. It has a method calls equals, it takes two A's represented by A and a B and checks for their equality. And we also have a section here called extension now this section has a parameter A and within that extension section, you can define multiple methods. In my case, I'm defining one method is equal to, which, which takes another A as input and, this, and then just uh, calls the equals method for A and B. So what this syntax is basically saying is that for any type A, for any type that is A, if you are able to find an equals implementation for A, then, up, then the method is equal to can be added to that A. So I will explain with an example. If we are able to define an equals for worker using some uh, implementations for equals, then basically the is equal to method is available on the worker class itself. So even though we didn't change the worker source code at all, it just feels natural. It just comes naturally that the is equal to method is defined on the worker class itself. And that is because of this extension keyword. So the extension keyword allows us to extend existing types, existing classes with new methods by using the type class. So if there was a type class instance present for A, for equals of A, then the method is equal to will be available on the type A. So that's a nice feeling that we get uh, by using the extension methods on type classes. So, so far we did an introduction to type classes. Uh, we saw what type classes are. We saw some new keywords given someone using extension. Now the second section of this talk is about type class derivation. It's about some meta programming concepts. Uh, let's see an example of how and why we would need this uh, type class derivation. We see a Scala 3 enum here. This is a, a new syntax for enums in Scala 3. The enum is called customer types. And there are two subtypes possible that can be an open customer and a closed customer. The open customer has a single property called session ID, which is of type string. The closed customer has two properties, a customer ID of long and a name of type string. Now let's assume we have a use case for our testing, for our UI or for ad hoc testing. The use case is we want to produce values of customer type. We, we want to create instances of customer type randomly. We want to use these random instances of customer type to fill up some UI or to do automation testing or for some use case. So that's our use case. We want to produce values of a type. And in this case, the focus is on customer type, but it can be for anything. We want to produce values of type. So going back to our type class pattern, we create a trait called producible with one type parameter A. And this producible type class has a method called produce, which produces values of type A. So this is how we represent the behavior of producing values of type A. And we want uh, customer type to be producible for now. What we also do is we come up with uh, some nice implementations of producible of string and producible of long. So we are telling the compiler, hey, here is how you can produce a random string. We are using the random library from the Scala standard library. And here is how you can produce a random long, again, by using the Scala standard random uh, class. Now, so far we have given the compiler information on how to produce a string and a long. 
and if you look carefully at the customer type and the subtypes they are eventually composed of strings and longs only i mean a customer type can be either open or closed if it's open it has just one string property if it's closed it has a long and a string property so it would be very cool that just by using these just by using these two uh, givens of how to produce string and long if the compiler could also produce open customer close customer and customer types that would be nice uh, and the scala 3 compiler can do that for us it is possible in scala 3 standard library to have this feature but the compiler will need some help from us so our goal for the remaining talk is to produce a producible of customer type or to generate automatically generate a producible of customer type just by using these two producibles and the logic behind our reasoning is that because a customer type and its subtypes are eventually composed of string and long this should be possible that's what you are saying we are saying build up the bigger things from the smaller things that should be something logical to do and as i said we will need to give the compiler some hints for this to work uh so what are those hints uh before we discuss those hints let's clear two concepts uh, for us so that everybody is on the same page uh what is a product type and what is a sum type in scala a product type first so this is a term or this is a concept of product type and there is also a type uh, in scala for product but the concept is that a product is something that when you need all the values for a type to be valid so if i create a case class user and if i need to create an instance of user i need to provide the id and the name if i miss any one of them i cannot create a valid user class so that is why user is a product type because i need all the elements of user to be present to have a valid user the same goes for a two element tuple if i have a two element tuple i need both the elements to create this tuple so that is product type when you need all the elements to create the original type the sum type is uh, the reverse so in sum types we just need one of the elements to be present to create a valid type so if we have a enum called customer type which has two types open and cust close customers if we can create a open customer then we have a valid customer type at hand we don't need to have both open and closed customers to create a valid customer type just one of them is fine the same goes for sealed traits also if we have a any one of them we get a valid uh, sealed trait as well so sum is basically when we need any one of the values to be present for a type to be valid so this is an important concept because i will use the words product and some types a lot in the coming uh, section of the talk so now we go back to our original problem we have a uh, some type which is a enum of customer type which has two subtypes and we have a property or a behavior for producing types of value a and we have a way to produce values of type string and long and using these two we want to produce or automatically produce values of type customer type also so let's see how we can let's see how we can define a flow to achieve what we require let's see a flow diagram to understand uh, how we can uh, solve this problem so the problem we are trying to solve is create a producible of customer type without having to define one ourselves mm -hmm. so the first thing we need to see is what is a customer type what is it it's a sum type it's an enum and it has two subtypes it has a open customer type and a closed customer type now the compiler should be able to figure out the names of these subtypes and the type of these elements also now for each element that we find we have to apply the same concept again for open customer 
what uh, elements does open customer have for closed customer what elements does closed customer have so open customer has a long element the closed customer has a long element and a string element now eventually the compiler will uh, keep doing this recursively for all the types and then it should find reducible instances for these uh, last element types so eventually the compiler will have to find a producible of long use that producible of long to produce a long value and using that long value create an open customer similarly for a closed customer the compiler must be able to find a producible of string and a producible of long produce a long and a string and create a closed customer and once it has either an open customer or a closed customer it can also create a customer type so that's the kind of flow that we want to achieve that we check the elements of a type we destructure them and then from that structure we find the producible instances for the uh, end uh, types so if for some reason the compiler is not able to figure out throughout this recursion the producible instance of any one type it should fail with the compile time error saying okay i was trying to derive uh, a type class for you but i could not figure out the type class for this element so i must stop now so this destructuring that we saw of types can be achieved in scala 3 using a class or a type known as mirror so this mirror a uh, trait or type is present in the scala standard library and the mirror trait is is defined in the scala library something like this it has some properties which are properties about the type level information of a type so mirrors will give us labels for a type the elements that the type has the labels of the element itself and so on and so forth and also we also need to know what that type is whether it's a sum or a product so mirror is extended by two other classes there is a product extending mirror and there is a sum extending mirror and a mirror is generated basically for every case class for every sealed trait or for every enum in your scala code the scala compiler will generate this mirror automatically for you and it will extend the right class also depending on what the type is if it's an enum it will create a mirror of sum if it's a class class it will create a mirror of product so this information is what we are going to use to basically derive automatically derive and give hints to the compiler uh, just to add more clarity for a enum type the mirror will be a sum type the mirror type will be a customer type the mirrored element types will be open customer and closed customer these are the elements of a customer type the label will be customer type and the labels for the sub type will be again open customer and closed customer and if we have a product like the case closed customer we will have the mirrored type as yeah the type itself closed customer the element types will be long and string because customer id is long name is string the mirrored label itself is the closed customer string and the element labels are customer id and name so what this class is giving us is a lot of type level information about our types um, and you see that the product also has a method called from product which can allow you to create the type also so if you give the elements of the type you will get the type also back and this similar a uh, mirror product is also created for open customer as well so it is created for basically all the case classes enum sealed traits in our scala code base okay so now we know there is a mirror trait in scala we know there are product types and some types and we are trying to derive automatically a type class for any type a now this type a can be a product or a sum so we first focus on the product type so what we are trying to say is automatically generate a producible of a if a is a product type uh, let, let's see how we can do that so the method is called derive product just a name that we gave it can be anything 
it works on a type a the type a must be product type and the end result of this method is a producible of a so if we are able to if we call this method derive product for any product type a it will give us a producible of a back automatically now the first parameter is a proof that a is actually a product uh, the second parameter is interesting it is a list of producible instances for all elements of a that is all elements that make up a and the implementation is pretty simple because this is a product we need to form all the elements we need to create all the elements to make an a because a is a product so we call the produce method on all these instances and then we pass them to the from product method and we get a back so this is the implementation for product to derive a producible of a for a product for example if we were looking at the closed customer which is a product type and it has id as long and name as string the way to call derive product for a closed customer would be like this the first element is the proof that mirror of product of closed customer this is as i said given by the scala compiler by itself the second element is the list of instances of producible for all elements that make up a and in our case a is a closed customer so the elements that make it up is a long and a string so we will have to pass a producible of long and a producible of string as a list so once we have those uh, instances we can call produce on each of them and then when we have each element so basically we'll create each element of type a here and then from all those individual elements we will create a back again so that's the simple logic that we apply to create a producible of a for a type a which is product now this was for product the same concept has to be applied to a sum type also what if the type is what if the type a is sum type and we need to create a producible of a from this a type the parameter list is again a list of producibles for all the elements that make up a and when we want to produce a it's a sum type so we know that we don't need all the elements to be created we can just create any one value and we are done because for some we just need one value to be present so we randomly pick up uh, an element from this list uh, we type cast it to producible of a because this will work and then we produce it so we basically can pick any element from this list of producibles call produce on it and then we get an a back and that is because a is a sum type so if we were calling derive sum for our customer type enum which is a sum type then the instance list will be a producible of open customer and a producible of closed customers so that's how we basically uh, call derive sum if we have to call it for a sum type and the logic is pretty simple just produce any one uh, element of this type a and we get the a back and again not too complex uh, if you understand the concept of uh, what a product and sum is and what a mirror is so now we have a way to derive a producible for a sum type and a way to derive a producible for a product type let's see how we can use these two methods now and the first thing that we have to do is we have to create that list of producible instances uh we were passing that list in both the derive sum and in the derive product method we needed that so how do we create that list of uh, producible instances so here is how we do it uh, we write a method called summon all uh, it's an inline method it is uh, at compile time optimization uh, summon all is a recursive method because it is being called within it itself also it takes a type a as a tuple and then destructures it 
So this erased value is a construct in the Scala 3 library to destruct a type basically. Basically, it will destructure A into its subtypes and then create the, the types here. Now, once we have the destructured types available, we can then summon uh, the producible for the head of that list, for the head of the destructured type, and then call the method again for the remaining list. So basically, in this, what we are doing is we are repeatedly applying summon inline, a built-in function that searches the given for a type class. And then we append that to the list that we get by calling the method again. So by using this method, we will, we will be able to get a list of producibles for all type elements of type A. Now, finally, is the implementation of producible of A. Uh, so we are saying derive a producible of A uh, if we have the mirror of A available. The first call is the summon call itself. And then once we have the instances of producers for elements of A, we can see whether the A is a sum or a product. If it's a sum, we call the sum method. If it's a product, we call the product method. And that's it, that's pretty simple. So we see those methods uh, together now. Uh, the first method is to derive all the instances of elements uh, for producible of A. And the second method is the implementation of deriving a producible of A for a type A. Now, we have given the compiler four hints. We have told the compiler how to produce instances of producible of A if it is of type product. We have told the compiler how to create a producible instance if A is sum. We have told the compiler how to summon all the producible instances for the subtypes and parts of A. And we have the derived implementation for the type A using all the three hints. So using these four hints now, and just by giving the producible for string and long, we are able to automatically derive a producible of customer type. We didn't have to write a given for the customer type or for the open customer or the closed customer uh, case classes also. Just by using the four hints that we gave and by using these two producibles, the compiler has generated automatically a producible of customer type for us. And we see that in use, we are calling uh, produce here and it's generating an open customer. The next time we call it, it is generating a closed customer. And there are some random values inside uh, the uh, properties themselves. So this is what we wanted to achieve, right? That without specifying a producible for the, the bigger type, and just by using the basic types, we get the type class instance. So this is type class derivation and we get type class instances for free. So whatever we did so far, we looked at the example of our enum, the customer type, but in the hints that we gave to compiler, we only focused on the producible type class. We didn't focus on any specific uh, enum or any specific case class. And what that means is we can generate a producible A for any type of abstract data type that is A. It's not limited to just the two enums and the types we saw. Example, suppose we have an enum which is uh, called as tree. It takes two type parameters, X and Y. We have a case node and a case branch, a pretty common tree with two sub branches left and right. And at the leaf, there is a node or a, a leaf, whatever you want to call it, which has two values of type X and Y. Now, without doing anything else, we can say, okay, can the compiler please derive for us a producible of tree of X and Y? And the only thing that we will make sure is that X is producible and Y is producible. That is, there is a producible instance of X and a producible instance of Y. If that is there, then we can derive a producible instance of tree of X and Y. And we do that here. We, uh, we summon a producible of tree, which consists of strings and longs. And because we had given producibles of strings and longs, this summon call works just fine. We are able to 
get this uh, instance and then we are able to call the produce method and we are able to generate random tree instances a branch and a node the important thing that i want to stress again is that these producible instances need not be given by us the compiler will automatically derive us for them so here i am asking to generate a type class producible for a tree where x is uh, long and y is customer type and i didn't give any given for customer type but the compiler will derive it for me and using that it will derive this producible also the super producible and then i can just call uh, produce on it and i will get uh, random tree values again with the right types so this is the ability to basically let the compiler take care of some boring and boilerplate stuff and we just need to define some hints of, on how to create producible for some and product types and the rest is done by the compiler so that's what i said it's a nice way to let the compiler take care of boring and boilerplate stuff the only thing is that because uh, all those definitions are in line uh, they are done at compile time all the check is done at compile time you need to make sure that the compilation is not getting too heavy in searching for all those individual type classes uh, that's all we need to be careful about but otherwise it it will give you a very nice uh, way of deriving type class instances just by using uh, some basic principles of building from the basic blocks so you give you define instances for the basic types and let the compiler derive the bigger types for you automatically and uh, this was automatic type class derivation this is a new feature in scala 3 in scala 2 there were some libraries that would help you do this uh, and they used macros but in scala 3 this can be done without any use of macros and so this is pretty helpful for especially for those who are working on libraries of their own um and that's what one wanted to see that's all about type classes and type class derivation so are there any questions are you surprised are you enchanted or is it like what just happened so uh, with that uh, i think if there are no other questions uh, thank you so much ayush for uh, this session uh, it was a great session thank i learned something new about scala i have no idea about scala but it was nice to see what changes are coming up and definitely we'll explore it further